Hello and welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I am your host, DK, and with me, as always, is my lovely co-host. Round of applause for C. Lou Green. And I think it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, you make. I think that's as far sure. as we can go without DMCA issues. The, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes from the movie uh, Big Fat Greek Wedding is when the kids are talking to the main character's aunt and they're like, Mom, can I drive? Can I drive? And she's like, you want to drive? You're driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I like that. I'm, I'm going to use that in the future. One of my favorite parts of the movie for sure. Um, anyway, we have a really great episode lined up for you. Uh, this episode is about... Doing too much and how to avoid, how to recognize when you're doing too much, how to avoid doing too much, and to stop doing too much is <laughs> the point of this episode. But right before we start, once again, we are currently live on Twitch. We are live on twitch.tv backslash DK Mixes. All of these links are available on mixingmusicpodcast.com. You can find our live stream, all of our platforms that we stream our podcast to. Um, all of the free stuff that we're giving away, our sponsors, anything, all the jazz. I write books, and I think that there's a link to some of the books that I write. It's children's books, so don't get your hopes too excited if you don't have kids. Uh, although, even if you're adult, I wouldn't be embarrassed if if I found out you were reading my, enjoying my books as a full grown adult by yourself. I would still be, I would still be flattered. Uh, but <laughs> I don't know if I'm leaking anything, but uh, is the is the 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 potty training one available? Yeah, yes, it, they are available on Amazon as well as for free if for a digital copy if you're interested in downloading a digital copy. Anyway, um, that's enough of the intro stuff. Uh, we can do some banter if you wish. Lou, you're doing good. I know you're doing good. That's fine. We're Americans. We, how are you doing doesn't really mean anything in America. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I could be somewhere else in the world and not doing as great. What? Hold on. Wait a second. No, I mean no. I'm, I meant like the idea of like <laughs> like <laughs> Americans say, "How are you doing?" and nobody ever cares to listen what the other person says. It, it's it's oh filler okay. Words. Well, it's I thought words. just in general. I'm just saying like, hey, I could be somewhere else, not as good of a situation, and you know what? I can appreciate what I have in front of me. Oh, okay. Yeah. That that's good yeah. too. We're we're blessed yeah. for sure. We're grateful. We're grateful. Hashtag uh, blessed. Uh, oh my god. Hashtag. <laughs> Remember when I put on the live stream, I had my youngest boy um, eating the microphone. I just realized he had left some snot on the microphone. Too. That's kind of gross. Um, uh, That's kind of gross. Sorry. Uh, but, um, Sorry. I didn't mean to laugh that hard, but let's let's get in. Let's get into the uh, this podcast. Here, episode. here. Just 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 to help out with that, just so it's not as embarrassing. OK, so you know how I was sick like a day or two ago? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, the the way I knew I was sick is when I woke up sneezing and like I had to like feel something on my cheek because I was sleeping facing upward. Oh no! Ew. Oh no! Yeah, there you go, uh, redeemed. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, we're gonna get back into the podcast episode um, today. We have a good one. We already talked about it. When you're doing too much, this happens to us all the time. Lou and I, we were talking about this before we started recording. This happens mm-hmm. to us constantly. Uh, this happens to me like at least a couple times a week. It's not embarrassing. It's actually a really great skill to have. We recognize that we do too much, then we kind of start over. Delete. Um, what whether you it's just individual did. tracks, I do. I'm doing too much with this vocal, and then I just delete all of the inserts and I go again, or whatever, or or maybe on the mix bus, or maybe I'm or doing we're too thinking much too production. much on it. A songwriting, I often do too much. Production, we do too much. Uh, what is it to me do too much? To what is it to do too much and and how can we stop and recognize when we are? Um, Lou, when was the last time that you did too much? Yesterday. <laughs> what did you do when you noticed? How did you, first off, when did you, how did you recognize that you were doing too much? Like, what kind of triggered you to be like, I think I'm doing too much? And then so, what did you do in order to try to fix it? So, uh, in a nutshell, um, I've got this opportunity to mix, um, I wouldn't say it's like a really big record, but it's it's a big artist, you know? Um, and it's actually kind of cool because I've been gunning to mix for this artist for a while, you know, and when it releases, you guys will see me post about it. But, um, when it kind of landed on my table to work on it, I was actually very excited, but also kind of nervous because I also didn't like the quality of the recording myself. And, um, I started thinking of like, how can I fix this? How can I fix this? And I started like 
really diving into the mix in the sense of like make this as best as possible because this is not only like your shot at working with this person as a mixer which previously is what i was gunning for for a long time um but you are also up against the odds of not the greatest recording you know in in a in a very not great sense um so I started focusing too much on making it like audibly perfect and this and that. And I started realizing when I went back to the demo that I didn't like what I did at all. Like everything that I did that I thought was making it better was actually working against the record. And that's when I quickly realized like, you know what, go just delete what you did, go back to square one. I went back and I did what I thought uh, not only kept the energy, but kept the emotion of the record alive and everything. And I turned a rough, what I thought was a rough version of that in because I still wanted to do more. And then I got a message like 30 minutes later saying like, dude, this is amazing. It's perfect. It sounds so great. Could you just make his vocal like a little bit louder? And that's it. And I was like, really? There's still so much more I want to do. And then in my head, I had to remind myself like, dude, you just struck gold. Like, why are you still going? Like they, they love it. Like, don't start doing so much that you're going to go back and want to restart again. Like you just did this. So, um, it took somebody else telling me like, dude, it, it sounds great because I was starting to get in my own head again. I think we do this all the time, whether you're professional or not. Yeah. This happens all the time. Like there's, here's a good example of something that happened. Um, for my third and most recent children's book that I publish, and if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to dkandkayoko.com or just go to links.dkmixes.com. <laughs> but uh, uh, in that third one, all the words in the book are actually lyrics to a song. So it's like a sing-along. So you can sing along um, in all the audio. There's also like a sing-along version, a karaoke version, so you can actually read along or sing along the book to your nieces, nephews, to your own children. Anyway, um, as I recorded this song, produced a song, and kind of like was going to mix this song for release distribution with this book, um, it was really interesting. I Before I mixed it, I bounced it, and I was going to mix it the next day. Uh, I bounced it and listened to it right before I go to bed, and I'm like, I think this is already done. I genuinely don't think I should do anything. I was planning on mixing it for like another couple hours, like tweaking in the details and everything. But the more and more I listened to it, I was like, this is done. And I think it took a lot of uh, humility to recognize that I didn't. It, you'd think it'd be the opposite, right? You'd think it's like, it's good, I'm prideful, so I don't have to do anything else. But it was the opposite. I was like, I wanted to do more. The, the pride in me was like, I, in order for me to be a proper mixer, I should be doing more. But then I listened to it, and I was like, yo, this is done. I don't have to do anything. So all I did was put a limiter on it. I didn't even do anything on the mix bus. I put a limiter on it, bounce it, done. It's, it sounds great. Um, granted the stakes are low. It's a children's song, <laughs> but, uh, uh, it was, I think that's a key, key thing to consider too at the end of the day. Yeah, no, th that's actually one of the things I want to bring up is, is, um, honestly speaking right now, if you're listening to the podcast or if you're listening on the live stream or on YouTube right now, if Drake came up to you and said, I need you to mix this song, would you be able to keep it together emotionally and be able to do your best work. I, I think that I would like to guess that most people would say, no, I'm not ready for it. Maybe it's a confidence issue. Maybe it's a, a lack of practice issue. But I would say even if you're really good at mixing and you have some great mixes, even if you're asking a pro, are you ready to just go for it right now? Um, it takes a different level to be able to do that. Because once you do it, I mean, it's going to be heard by millions of people, if not a billion or so people, you know, uh, and that's going to that's going to be part of your name forever. That's it's kind of scary to a certain degree. Can you keep it together? So with this, it's it's extra hard not to do too much. For example, with Lou and this new opportunity with the new artist who's a bigger name. Right. I think that it's impressive mm -hmm. that you were able to recognize when you were doing too much because it's I think it's harder to do so when pressure's on the line. You know, there's more on the line. Um, but yes, we often do too much. And honestly speaking, I think a good general um, guiding rule, not really a rule, but a guiding principle is usually when things don't sound good, it's often an indication that you're doing too much. Mm -hmm. Have you ever 
Have you ever found out that things sound worse because you didn't do enough? Mm. Very few and far between, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that usually when I was trying to be conservative with moves, when I was being a little too technical and careful, and this is something I actually was told in the past, and I've, I've kept this to heart, because every time I think about it, it, it rings true. Somebody once said that I mix too carefully. And I could never have voiced that myself in a way that was as accurate as that. Mixing too carefully, meaning that I was trying to focus on so many minor details that, you know what, it sounded like I didn't do enough because it didn't serve the purpose of the record. In that sense, yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Um, I was working on a jazz hip hop album and they said you mixed it like it was a pop record. Like you tried to be too clean with it. You, you were too this, you're too that, but everything that he was saying I was too, too with, right. Um, was me being too careful, like trying to be as minimalistic, as clean, as surgical as possible versus being like, I wasn't as colorful with these changes, but honestly speaking, that's one of those where like, you know, going overboard was kind of the desired end result, but I did too that's much usually, of the technical and not enough of point. the creative. And usually that's a production point at that point. It's a production, a production point. point yeah. It's a production point, but I was working with the producer on the mixing because the producer only knew how to produce. He didn't know how to mix at all. So everything that I was getting was just raw ideas. Mm -hmm. And so you could say I was essentially co-producing the arrangement and the element balance and all that kind of stuff, but... At the end of the day, that kind of rang true. It was like, it sounds like you were being too careful. Being too careful is another thing that I guess you could say you could, you're doing too much of. Yeah. You're being too technical now. You're not, so, you so forgot about the creative. Say, so I honestly can't think of like maybe one time where I did too little and that was the, that was the problem. Uh, and that was a specifically a mastering thing. <laughs> You know, I mean, or... you could do too little when it comes to like, you know, I know we're a fan of doing dry as an effect because like people underestimate the the idea of putting less reverb and delays, you know, not that you shouldn't put any, but, you know, just do less. But like, have you ever listened to a mix and like, OK, that was too dry. <laughs> but I mean, like, I use dry change, as think, too much of an effect. Doing too much, I think doing too much means that you change it too much. I don't think that means you take away things. Like, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah, that's yeah. what so, I'm so, saying. Like, you lose the feel of something. So, like, if the demo was really wet and I do less in terms of reverb, but that wasn't the vibe. That's I would say that's still doing too much, right? You change yeah, it too much. Exactly. But, uh, um, yeah, I oftentimes do too much, and I and I would say that in most cases people do too much, and it's really good to and it's 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 a good practice to recognize when you're doing too much. I think a couple of signs that you may be doing too much is when you're doing things based off of habit and not off of instinct. Meaning, you boost mm -hmm. the top, you put on a 10K shelf on your vocals because that's what you do for every song. And you honestly didn't put in the effort of just listening. That's when you know you're probably doing too much. Or you might be doing too much. Or if you're EQ, and this happens all the time, like, I don't think it's bad for, I do not think that you should determine what you should do based on what your EQ looks like or what your gain reduction meter on your compressor looks like. Like, that is not important. But to a certain degree, I would say that there's a fine balance between if your EQ looks freaking crazy, at least crazier than normal, you might be doing too much. <laughs> you yeah. might be a redneck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like, it doesn't mean that you are, and it's okay for EQs to look crazy and compression gain reduction meters to look crazy. Like, you shouldn't really be paying attention to those things. But I think that's usually a sign where, um, and, and I've, I've, uh, in scuba diving, so you know, I have a recreational scuba diving license, and I don't think it ever expires. Um, but I got mine when I was like 14, 15. So you go down to 60 feet. And why 60 feet, and this, the, don't worry, stick along, because this actually does pertain to this, And I, um, is when you go below 60, 60 feet, there's something, there's a weird phenomenon that happens with the human body. Um, and there's an actual, like, line. It's not visible, but it's, it's, you, it's like you can literally hold on to someone's leg and dip their head below that line, that, the amount of, like, where the pressure changes, where, where they all of a sudden get drunk and they don't remember which way is up. 
and you have to pull them out. So when you go below 60 feet, you have to have a different license and a special oxygen shake that has a lot more nitrogen in it. And most people that die from scuba diving, other than cave exploring, cave, cave scuba diving is really dangerous without the proper training and equipment. Um, then that like kills people like crazy if for untrained people. Um, but uh, if if the most people, reason why people die is they dive too deep, they forget which way is up because they get drunk, they go too deep, they're not paying attention to their barometer or how deep they're going, um, and they get drunk, they forget which way is up, and they think that they're going to the surface, but they're actually diving further down, which is really scary, quite frankly. And the further you go down, the more pressure it is, the more that the air in your vest that's keeping you afloat it shrinks down, so you start sinking faster and faster and faster, and you don't ever recognize this. This happens even when you're not drunk. Like, even when you have, when you're above 60 feet, depending on the lighting, um, depending on how reflective the sand is, sometimes you'll be diving, you'll be paying attention horizontally, laterally, right? Like, look at the fish, and so often, uh, you, start, you start to, maybe you flipped upside down at one point, especially in open waters, you don't really recognize which way is up anymore. And that's normal, the more time that you spend down. And the scuba diver instructor made this incredibly clear and tried to make this as poignant as possible, explicit as possible, is to always pay attention to which, which way the bubbles are floating up. Always, even if you are confident that is the ground or that is the, that is the surface and you think you might be going towards the surface, pay attention to the bubbles. Because the bubbles will never, ever lie. And for us, that's like our reference track or kind of like the feeling. We need to recognize when we may not know which way is up. And that's really hard. What is bubbles to us, Lou? So like for you, what kind of snaps you back in? If you've been mixing for a while, you might be getting a little fatigue. You might be forgetting which way is up, right? Um, and how much high end is too much high end and how much low end is too little low end or too much low end. How do you kind of reference and come back to getting your ears right? So two things. Walk away. Like give yourself a break. After about 30 minutes to an hour, go play a video game for 10 minutes or something. Go get yourself some water. Go fart. I don't know. Doesn't really matter what you do. <laughs> um, what is that? But go out of the room and fart. Let's expand on this idea a little bit more. Lou, how does this pertain to your problem? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. It, it's more of a bathroom break. But yeah, you know, it's just you know, sometimes you sit down and you let one loose. You know, it, it is what it is. <laughs> If you if you go children's style, you go to the bathroom and just completely drop chow and, uh, you know, just, you know, let it rip. Either way, as long as you let it rip, you know, you release some of the pressure that might be causing fatigue in your ears. <laughs> you, you never know. You know, I'm just saying maybe you we got the bends in the toilet. Of, we apologize on behalf of all the people <laughs> listening right now. Uh, but no, uh, but though, yeah, so. no, honestly, like giving yourself an ear break and then honestly. Do anything outside of sound outside of sound when you come back in listen to the reference track first listen to the rough mix or whatever first and then get a vibe don't listen to the balance just get the vibe and then see how you feel when you go back to yours now that you've got fresh ears now that the fatigue that you had has gone away now that you got some water and some farts released you know see how you feel when you went from theirs first and then listen to yours after reason being is that if I don't feel an immediate sense of pride, chances are I did too much. I think that that's an important skill to have. I think, I do think taking breaks is the number one form of, in, in this case, in this example, is the bubbles. Taking breaks. Stepping yeah. away from your speakers, from your computer, whether that's five to ten minutes, fifteen minutes, or whether it's three days, or whether it's a month. Actually, you know what's another way? Uh, I don't have this anymore, but I used to do this. Uh, you remember on the Grace, because uh, we have the Grace M905 in the A room. Do you remember how on it, it actually has an SPL meter? I'm yeah. not the type of person that tells you to monitor at a specific number. That's irrelevant. Everybody's ears are different. Um, there are standards and tests and studies that actually prove, you know, certain information like, you know, you know if you're monitoring between 85 and uh, no, what is it? 78 and 85. I forget what the numbers are, but like, it's supposed to be the most linear listening situation, blah, blah, blah. whatever. Um, Pensado is deaf. The dude's always monitoring above 90. Um, you know, 
whatever works for you, whatever works for you. But try to keep a number that you just seemingly feel comfortable at. And the moment you notice yourself start turning it up from there, it's probably time to take a break. Because if you feel the need to turn it up, that means your ears are fatiguing. Yeah. I I do think that it's not uncommon for ears to fatigue. It's not uncommon for even high pro-level mixers to kind of get lost in the sauce and, and just kind of fig- lose which way is up. It's important to take breaks. That's the number one thing. I think that we're going to come back to talk about this in many ep- episodes, across many episodes like we already have. Um, I've heard of some old school mixers that leave a radio on quietly in the room. So like if they pause the music oh my for a God. second... And they just listen to the radio. And I assume that gets annoying. But first, I've heard of some old school engineers do that. They pause the music. They listen to the radio and listen to what's on the radio for just a second. And then they come back to their own reference. So they're like constantly referencing. They don't turn it off. Kind of. A you thing. know what? I guess you could say Super Smash Bros. was that for us. I don't know if you remember. Like I would mix with the A-Room door open. And uh, Super Smash Bros. was always running in the lobby. And everybody would always bring up, like, isn't it distracting? I'm like, low-key, kind of helps i don't know why but maybe that's why i don't know what it is but i've this is the first time i've ever heard you mention anything on that level and oh i kind of like it yeah and there's also um i mean obviously you do this a lot which is like a being against tracks uh, Mm -hmm. making sure that you're all in the right ballpark you know that's a great thing um i do think that the longer and more experience you have the longer you've been doing this the more experience you have um, the longer you can go without fatiguing and without getting lost. Um, I also, I think that that, what do you feel like? Is that a true statement? I'm just kind of throwing this up in the air. I have no idea. I think, I think the, I think the concept behind it is true. I think the honest physical ability to do that is not true because your ears can take damage even at 85 decibels. Uh, so if you're monitoring at 85 decibels for a prolonged amount of time, technically speaking, you will fatigue, scientifically speaking, you know? Um, so if you're monitoring really quietly, which honestly, like after a conversation with like Jesse, um, you know, about like, you know, I think this is in part of the podcast, I believe. Like, do you monitor loud? Do you monitor quiet? You know, how do you like to monitor? Um, because Jesse is all about his monitoring experience. You know, he doesn't even have a desk. It's just him in a chair and his keyboard and mouse is on his lap. Um, but honestly speaking, you're right. Like you start to know which way is up a lot more easily and a lot more, uh, I guess, instinctively. Uh, for instance, I was sick yesterday and, um, you know, when I was mixing the song, I had to literally rely on everything I knew to kind of help guide me in the right direction to get this mix right because they needed it like yesterday so that they can shoot a music video to a day. And I have to still shoot out a final mix, but I thought I was going to completely fail it, to be honest. I thought I was going to fail this rough mix um, because I was sick. My ears were fatigued. They were. They felt like I was underwater, but knowing how to reference songs, knowing how to listen for certain information, knowing how to like A, B, the vibe and everything, it it kept me in the right direction. But there were many moments where I felt like I was failing. Absolutely. So yeah. one of the tools that, another thing that we could do is talk about one of the tools, some of the tools that we use. So I don't think you should mix visually, meaning that you should be mixing while looking yeah. at meters and relying on them. But there are a few tools that we use that are quite helpful. And I'm going to take a quick break right here and talk about one of the tools that we use via our sponsor. Thank you. A big shout out to Isotope for sponsoring our podcast. We're really, really grateful to have Isotope on our team supporting us. Um, If you are interested in 10% off of any of their products or would like an extended trial period instead of the regular seven days trial period, you can do 30 days. You can go to isotope.com backslash MM podcast. One more time. That's isotope.com backslash MM podcast. Lou and I, we were talking on the last episode about how much we love and use tonal balance control, which is isotopes. frequency analyzer metering system thing and i quite often use insight i love insight for uh my mastering and and making sure that things are at the right levels um those are both isotope tools that we love and use oh again if you're interested in that go check them out on their website isotope.com backslash mm podcast but when i use tonal balance control the way that i use it i don't try to get the line in 
the bar. So they have like this reference bar that you try you can try to get the frequencies in and you can actually upload your reference tracks so it changes like the reference bar. What I do is the way that I use it is I mix without it, looking at it. <clears throat> and then um I try to I take a break, I come back to it, I listen to it. If if what I'm hearing, so for example, if I purposely mixed it to be pretty mid dip, like there's a big dip in like two one K to two K, and if I don't see that dip on the tonal balance control, and it doesn't reflect what I'm hearing, then I know I need to change something. Or if it's showing that there's a peak in a specific frequency, but I'm not hearing it, then I might want to change something. That's typically, that's typically how it goes by, uh, how I use it. So like, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and how do you use tonal balance control to kind of make sure that you're not doing too much? So I think yeah we brought this up on the previous episode basically uh talking about how bob and i will import a reference track i don't necessarily use the reference track as kind of like a guiding point like oh you have to have a certain amount of this frequency and this and that but rather like hey you know their reference track is their reference track um and it may have less bass than what they want, but let's listen to the overall feel of the mix. Like, you know when it's a lot of bass, when it starts to feel different. Like, the amount of bass isn't really necessarily the issue. It's the relationship in it. But tonal balance control is a really good way to be able to, like, listen to the relationship of things in their own frequency pockets because you can actually use it to zone in in certain ranges you can make it more narrow when you pull it down more wider when you pull it up but um like i was uh, uh matt villanueva uh, our assistant here in the mix uh, he asked me to critique uh, a rock mix that he did and i was showing him how i like to use it which is just like hey Something between like 100 to 200 hertz. There's something going on with the kick and the snare. Solid it out. I'm like, see, listen to this. It sounds like the kick was almost like tuned to key, but the snare is kind of a little bit off. You know, maybe just shaving off a little bit of this frequency will like stop that little bit of like rub that's going on there. Um, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, but either way, you know, I like using it just as like, cool. Like we have a reference point for like what's where, how loud something is. But I like to just use it as like, oh my God, did you change my name to Silu Green on the screen? <laughs> Sorry, complete squirrel thought. I just saw that. <laughs> but um, I really like using it as like a reference point of like, hey, like it might be getting a little muddy compared to the other song. There might be a lot of 200 hertz. Maybe just zone in on that and almost like a mix cue where you can listen to a certain frequency range. Just use that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I do that all the time. Also in order for me, another trick that I use in order to, I wasn't using it for a long time. Like ever since I got these speakers, these new speakers mm -hmm. that Lou and I now have together, we have the same speakers. We, um, Aww, twins. Uh, but, oh, uh, and we have the same lamps. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but ever since we got these speakers, I stopped using a mix cue, but I recently set it up again last, last week or last couple weeks and been using it again. Um, and I sold my extra one to Matt, uh, I love it. Like, I, I just turning it on for a quick minute, real quiet and mono, and I leave it off to the side. It's not even, like, in front of me or anything like that. Um, it's a really great reference. Uh, also, referencing as far as, like, bouncing your mix and listening to it in AirPods or in your car, if that's where you're comfortable listening to more music at. I'm not condemning anybody that does a car test. Like, if that's where you're more comfortable with music, then do a car test. Check on your AirPods. Check on your speakers, wherever you're more comfortable with. Um, don't rely on everything. I, I feel have, I know a lot of people that take referencing way too far and mm -hmm. trust the car test and be like, Oh, on the car test, I'm hearing a little bit too much bass, but on the AirPods, I'm not hearing enough. And I, I can't, you got to pick one or the other dude. Like I can't do both of them the for bubbles. you. I can't boost the bass or lower the bass. Yeah. Um, it's not going to translate perfectly on every single source, but, uh, whatever you're most comfortable with, um, I think it's good to compare. Imagine that. trying these, to boost the bass on your mix right? cube. What's that? Imagine trying to boost the bass on your mix cube. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah. these are all bubbles. Um, I think the most important skill out of everything that we're doing is, or talking about, is recognizing when you are doing too much. I think that, for example, I, it's this weird sensation. Like, I'm mixing, and I can tell that I'm getting tired, I'm getting fatigued, and I know I'm starting to do things, and I'm not, I'm not able to think through them quite well. I'm very aware of when I'm starting to forget which way is up. And I have to take a break. I don't care if there's interns watching or if the client is watching. I will be like, hey, 
I'm taking a break, 10 minute break, and I lay on this rug on my back. I pull up my phone or do something else, read a book. It doesn't matter. I am laying on this rug on my back, relaxing, not listening to anything, and just chatting it up with the client or with an inter whoever's with me or hanging out if there's anybody like that. Uh, you know, I kind of want to see that one day. I kind of want you to take that kind of break with me one day. Well, if if you're on YouTube right now or if you're watching live, I can show you what it lo- what it looks like. Here it is. May here do commentary and describe to people that are on the podcast what I'm doing right now. Okay. All right. So DK's looking like Goku going Super Saiyan halfway through. Now DK's just laid on his back, sprawled out like a starfish. It says wet guests because he's covered the R and the A on wet grass, uh, which is an off-white uh, IKEA uh, grass-like uh, rug, and he's literally just laid out there like he is looking graceful. He is looking like all the stress of the world has just lifted from his body, like his soul just escaped. Oh, now he's come back to life. He's smiling. He's aware. He's ready to mix. <laughs> he's got fresh ears, and oh my God, he's glowing. <laughs> Honestly, that that deserves an applause because that was really, really great commentary. Hold on, I might have something for this. Uh, but uh, it it's funny. Um, yeah, the rug is is it's a shag rug from IKEA when Virgil Virgil Abloh did the IKEA off white collaboration, and it says wet grass in quotations. Um, I have a picture on my Instagram where I put my child over the R, so it says wet ass. Or over the G, over the GR it says as wet ass. <laughs> I mean, which would on some days be very accurate. Yeah, I mean they do wear diapers, so it made sense. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, that's kind of it for this episode. I don't think it's too crazy. I I do think that um, kind of to sum up general guideline. If it's starting to sound bad, you might be doing too much, and it is probably that you are. It's it's much more easy to do more than it is to accidentally do too little. Um, The higher level up you go in the pro world, the less they do. We didn't really talk about that, but the the more experienced the artist is, the more experienced a... uh, Well, I find it's not always the case, um, but tonally it doesn't change too, too much. It shouldn't. A mixer, a high-level mixer... Um, no. and granted that's because usually the recording engineers is doing the most of the, most of the grunt work, um, at higher levels, right? Um, shout out to high level recording engineers that actually know what they're doing. They make every mix. Yes. Like, Let's uh, give breeze. them a quick shout out. Cause that's the biggest challenge on yesterday's mix. Like y'all, if you ever want to move forward, uh, or get a good application somewhere, get a referral from a mixing engineer that has to mix your recordings. Because if you did a really good job on recording, the mixing engineer will be very thankful of your experience and and involvement. In fact, they would refer clients. Mixing engineers that don't want to record refer clients to the recording engineers they can trust to get it right. Amen. So anyway, um, don't do too much. Listen, use your ears, do things, move with intention, um, not out of habit. Uh, I think it's good to use... uh, um, instinct. Just, just use your primal instinct. What does it sound like? Does it sound too much? It sounds too little? Uh, don't care too much. Don't overanalyze. I think we talked a little bit about that last episode. Um, but in general, and recognize, try to recognize, practice recognizing when you forget which way is up and making sure that you're not doing too much and you're not doing things for the sake of doing things. Um, take your time if you have to. You do not have to mix fast. Just make sure you mix with intention. Yeah. All right, I think that's kind of it for this episode. Any other thoughts you want to add, Lou? I think that's it. Honestly, um, you know, I will say that there is the concept of doing too much with one specific thing, which is not the point of this episode at all. Honestly speaking, if you're ever feeling like you did too much or you didn't, my favorite, favorite reference point. This is the ultimate reference point. Nothing else will ever beat this. No matter how DK uh, references his mixes, no, 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 anyone, anyone, you will Uh-oh. never beat this one either. Oh, this is this is general. Show your mix to Everybody somebody will. else. Ah, uh, show your work. Show your work. I probably clipped on that one, but still, show your work. Show your work to somebody else, and watch how many notes you give yourself. Yeah, Invite you... somebody to the room and just stand there as they listen to it, and you'll be like. Oh man, I overcompress the vocal. Oh damn, that ad lib is too loud. Oh damn, this and that. Show your work. Just show people. As embarrassing as it sounds, that's the number one way I know if I've done too much or not. 
Show your work. Any tool that you could buy online will never beat showing your friend your mix because even if they don't downshoot it, you're going to downshoot yourself. Yeah, that's that's that is true. You listen differently when you're showing someone than when you're listening by yourself. Yep. That is true. So I think that's a great place to end it. Thank you so much, Lou. Thank you so much for everybody that's participating right now in the chat. Shout out to everybody that's hanging out right now. Linhart97 on Twitch. Farzam, what up? What up? Uh, appreciate you all sticking around on Twitch, on YouTube. We have a bunch of people here. Find all of our live streaming, our, our books, our recommendations, our sponsors, everything on mixingmusicpodcast.com. And on that note, happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy. Stay saucy.